I want to thank Francesco for a very clear, very to the point presentation. And uh, so uh, let's uh, have questions from the students. And I would ask the students to uh, tell their names and what they're doing, in which degree they're in, uh, enrolled. Student here, yes. <laughs> I was a student, <coughs> so uh, I, uh, Giovanni Gorno, and some of you may have seen me uh, in, uh, in previous meetings here. Um, I completely agree with the diagnosis that uh, you have uh, described today, but the, the real point that, that I would ask is on the last line, even if deficit could temporarily increase. And that is the whole issue of uh, how Europe functions in these days. Uh, what you are suggesting is Italy unilaterally going against the pact that has agreed just uh, by the previous two governments. Uh, and that, as I'm, I'm sure you know very well, is not uh, at all easy to do, in particular for a country that uh, in the last four years has changed, has changed for governments. Uh, it is an issue of credibility, it is an issue of consistency. Uh, so what are the chances, uh, in your view, that something like that could be approved by the European Commission? So approved? Uh, zero, because these guys uh, have the rules and they go by the rules. But I think there are uh, two conditions uh, that would make at least a negative statement uh, with some distinction that would help. One is uh, using precedent. So there's a large country in Europe, France, that has a deficit in the next, has already announced the next year will be at 4.3, so it will be 1.3 above. And uh, people are not happy, but France is doing it. And, uh, and uh, so there is one precedent. So my view is uh, in probably stay within France. So do 4.2 to be at least, but there is France. And second, although I agree that the rules have since changed, there is a precedent which is interesting because uh, Chancellor Schroeder in Germany in 2003, remember in 2003 Germany was the sick man of Europe. No, the sick man of Europe was not Greece or Portugal, it was Germany. And what uh, Chancellor Schroeder did, did a very deep reform of the labor market. This reform which is uh, known you know, of Mr. Hartz, who is the guy who had the committee who, who wrote the new labor market laws, and then Chancellor Schroeder went to, to the rest of the European and said, look, I did something nobody had done in Germany before. I completely transformed the labor market. Now I need to uh, increase demand, the lower tax, and increase spending temporarily. Allow me to do it, and he was allowed to exceed the 3% for three years. Now, the rules have changed since then, but so there is the present today of France, and more importantly of Germany. Of course, the German president comes with a uh, qualifier that Schroeder did this after having done something dramatic in the labor market. So and this is why what, what you read in the paper, what we're discussing today, is so crucial. So the discussion about the reform in the labor market are, of course, relevant for the labor market, but otherwise they would not be done, especially for the young people uh, to allow them to enter the, 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 the labor market. But more importantly, that they are a big signal. So they're a signal that something that we've been trying to do for the past 30 years, we finally do it. And then we'll be able to say, like Schroeder said, we did something dramatic, now give us some air for a few years. So these, I think, are the conditions. Because the judgment, the formal judgment of the commission will be negative, so we'll end the procedure. But France has been a procedure for a long time. And if inside the procedure, what they tell you to do, you have to do reform, and say, I did it yesterday, it's already, uh, it's, you're in a better position. Other questions? Yes. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my name is Elisabetta, and I'm studying economics and management. I hope you're studying ancient Greek. No, uh, but uh, actually I've done just some exams of economics, so I'm not uh, a specialist at all. Um, but you were very clear, and I'm trying to follow in the um, politics here in Italy, at least to be, uh, at least to, to know what is happening in my in my state, in my in my nation, and. 
what I meant to ask you is just probably could be divided in two. The first thing is why it is so difficult to um, let people understand about economics and financial things uh, in order to be aware of what is happening uh, because my what I, what I I think I, I try I understand I understand during my during my day is that people don't understand this and they try to comment on things they don't they don't know and so this is not useful to well to have a to have an idea a right idea of what is happening and um, the other thing is what I get from your from your presentation is that probably what this government is doing is probably the best thing, or actually a good thing, because uh, the line was going up. So it was quite a good thing to rely on the spending review. And um, do you think it's, it is possible? It, it is going to, to work on, or are we going to have another change of government because he, he or this government will be understood or not. Thank you. So the second one, I, I obviously don't know. I, I, I think it's, uh, we don't know what is, going, what is going to happen, but I think at least it's important, this goes to your first question, to try to understand the parameters of the decisions. I think that today, or if you spend some time looking at the slide, I think that when you will read the papers on, on October 15 and, and read the budgets, you have all the 28 budgets on October 16, and so you look at them, what did Italy do relative to Estonia, to France, to Denmark, and so on. We have to evaluate how these countries uh, face the problem of high unemployment. It is a common problem, except in Germany, it's a common problem. So at least now we understand, we have some parameters to understand what happens. Uh, your first question is, why do we, I don't think it's only in economics that people uh, express views without uh, being, based, being based on something. Uh, you hear it every day in medicine, you know, people discuss pros and against uh, a special treatment for cancer without having an idea of whether this thing works or not. That's why I sort of bored you with some time on statistics and this thing, because uh, I think that all these decisions in economics, like in any other field, need to be based on data, possibly on experiments. Now, in, in medicine, it's easy, because in medicine you can do a trial, you can have a placebo and a medicine and do the trial and then see what is the effect of the medicine, decide whether the medicine works or not. In economics, it's a bit more difficult, you can, we cannot have a placebo economy there and a true one here, but we try to do something, they say, what I show you, was attempts to try to do experiments. So the, I think the, so the message is uh, try to look at the data and uh, so if you do economics, spend most of your time studying statistics and econometrics because it's from the data you understand. Uh, uh, no uh, uh, physicist would uh, look at theories without, without data, right? So that, but unfortunately, you say the public debate, people just give opinions and not, not based on them. So, uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. I'm Federica, I'm studying foreign languages. And I wanted to ask, yes, I think so. foreign languages. Yes. I wanted to ask, um, when an Italian citizen comes up with an analysis like this, what are the possibilities for him to get this analysis um, into the government or just make the government aware of the analysis and what are the chances of being heard? Uh, no, I think that probably more than in other fields, uh, economists are rather lucky because uh, they're, listen doesn't mean followed. They are certainly listening. So the views uh, of economists certainly sort of uh, transpire into, into the decision-making um, process. Also because in the decision-making places there are many economists. Now our current finance minister in Italy is a good economist, the president of the ECB is a good economist, and actually finance minister in all European countries tend to be most countries good economists. So the ideas get there, but that's the easy part. 
the difficult parts of the idea gets there, uh, how do you implement? And she was mentioning uh, spending. So how do you go on the, on the blue as opposed to the red? The, the, the red is easy, right? You, you sign a piece of paper, you say, as of tomorrow, uh, the value added tax is increased by 5%. People complain, but by this done, and, uh, and uh, saying uh, I'm reducing uh, uh, employment in the public sector by 5% uh, is much more difficult. So here I told you that if you do it, and these are, the blue lines are based on actual experiments, so where, where it happened, it had this effect. Uh, doing it is a, is a different uh, thing. Good um, evening. My name is uh, Marco Rico and I study at Restro. And, uh, well, uh, you have uh, just explained us the importance of uh, reducing taxes uh, for, uh, for Italy today. And uh, my question is, uh, which uh, kind of taxes should the uh, government uh, reduce? Uh, company taxes or uh, uh, taxes uh, paid by uh, physical person? And uh, could be useful the reduction of uh, direct taxes and the increasing of uh, indirect taxes? Actually, a super sophisticated question. Uh, so, the, so there are two ones. So to remain within what I said, namely being based on data, what we did so far, so the blue and red, red line I show you, look at overall taxes and overall spending. So unfortunately, when you look at plans, there are not enough plans to be able, for example, it would be interesting, as the gentleman who was here before, it would be interesting in knowing what is the effect if you cut infrastructure spending. Uh, as opposed to cutting pensions. So the, still there are not enough data to do that, but hopefully we'll get there. Uh, in terms of what I think should be done, uh, the most important element of the tax that should be reduced is tax on labor. Uh, to give an order of magnitude, the difference between the cost of labor for the firm and what the worker takes home net of tax is, is 50%. Now, uh, of this part is paid by the worker, part is paid by the firm. To reduce the taxes paid by compact firms uh, to the level of Germany, which is not the lowest in Europe, but is a standard, uh, it would cost, uh, in terms of less revenues for the Italian government, 40 billion euro. So 40 billion euro, GDP is 16, so it's what is... Uh, Two, two point something percent. So when I, when I say we should cut taxes by, by 2% of GDP, I think we should cut taxes by maybe not all 40, maybe 30 billion, but that tax. So the difference between the cost of labor, because by doing that, you increase competitiveness automatically, right? Because then firms can, uh, the, the cost of labor goes down, and they can transfer it in, into lower. So that's the most important one. Um, uh, uh, direct indirect taxes, VAT, is more troublesome because that uh, reduces uh, the purchasing power of households, right, because the stuff costs more. So I would, I would concentrate on labor tax. <coughs> well, I, I have a question. Um, so someone mentioned before, you also mentioned, uh, of course, when, when it comes to uh, reducing spending, it's much harder and, you know, it takes more time. Um, but I think what is very difficult is to say, where do, you, where do you cut the spending? And that's where the problem comes. So you mentioned, for example, pensions or you mentioned um, infrastructure. Unfortunately, our government, uh, well, not this current government, but in the past, there is a long history of governments cutting on research. That's the easiest one, because as soon as they have problem, where they cut is research, because that's not hurting anyone. Pensioners go on the street and protest. Um, government employees go on the street and protest, but these poor researchers, nobody listens to them. So even if they go on the streets and they ask for more, you know, um, uh, physical equipment, so more laboratories, nobody's listening to them. So it's, it's a hard part. I think. That's where we fail, I think, is when it comes to saying, where do we cut exactly? Well, it's not a, there are two elements of this. First of all, there are some obvious things. 
So the Italian government spends, so the, why, why we find the 30 billion to cut the labor tax that was taken before? The government gives out to private sector companies in subsidies 30 billion. For example, uh, uh, the uh, uh, small uh, uh, say, uh, truck drivers uh, who essentially don't pay the petrol they, they use uh, receive 2 billion per year. Why should we pay? Of course, they are happy, right? They're going to be very unhappy if you take the two billion away. But why should we subsidize tax drive, uh, truck drivers as opposed to, I don't know, someone else? So there are obvious ways of thinking about that. <coughs> then, I think there is another element, which is <coughs> mental research. Uh, you should not look at, for example, at the university system as a given. So the university system in Italy is, and in France and in Germany as well, is not free but very close to being free. One of you, a university student in, uh, in Italy, on average, costs uh, 7,000 euro per year. Of course, those who do medicine more, those who do foreign languages less, but the average is 7,000. Uh, you don't pay 7,000 euro. You have a scholarship, but even those who pay, you certainly don't pay 7,000 euro. If you look that, at the fact that across the distribution of income, the, the children of the poor uh, end the university less than the children of the rich, it, nobody pays, uh, if everybody pays less than 7,000, what is happening, it is paid through the taxes, so the poor are subsidizing the rich. So one way to find money for research would be to introduce a uh, tuition at Kafoskari, which is uh, 12,000 euro per student. Of the 12, seven go to pay the cost, and the remaining five go into scholarship for those who are brilliant and, and uh, come from low income. Also. That's a way to, to bring in the money. Uh, the idea that uh, you, university is free and then you don't have money for research, it's sort of is working within a constraint that cannot, that cannot work. Um, and my view is that also if, if, uh, if students uh, uh, pay, those who can pay, then uh, uh, they become uh, much more careful in the quality uh, they receive. If the university is for free and the professor doesn't show up, which doesn't happen at Kafoska, but in some university happen, but you say he didn't show up, but it's for free, what can I ask? If you pay 10,000, if your parents pay 10,000 euros and the professor doesn't show up, you are very upset and you tell the guy next time to show up. So the incentive system also, also changes. Same thing in a, in a different area for, for infrastructure. So there is this big discussion, we don't have enough infrastructure. It's not true. Italy spends in infrastructure, roads, airports, ports, more or less as much as all other European countries, maybe a bit less in the last couple of years, but on average, like, except that we have to build a, a, a kilometer of road, we pay 10 and the rest of the Europe pays 5. So uh, we have less infrastructure, not because we spend less, but because the money ends up somewhere else. This being said, even uh, if we were able to spend the same, it is not obvious that uh, new infrastructure uh, is the obvious way to do it. For example, now the government decided to build a new highway from essentially Florence, from Perugia to Venice on the Adriatic coast. There is already, uh, so this would reduce the time, the traveling time from Perugia to Mestre by maybe an hour, an hour and a half. It takes about 10 years to have a first degree judgment from a civil court in Italy. So where would you put the money? In speeding up the civil procedure in court or in reducing an hour in the Perugia? It's not obvious right there. So this idea that uh, you need to spend on infrastructure is not there. Today on the question of uh, resource for research, uh, which is obviously something we, uh, a question which is dear to many of us uh, working in the academia. Uh, it's clear that there is a, a question of uh, how many resource uh, also citizens are willing to pay for this. Uh, but I wonder if there isn't only also a, a cultural issue and consequently a, po a political uh, issue, meaning decisions to be made in that direction. Because after all, I think you mentioned. 
I, I think this is true that uh, tuition is uh, relatively low also in Germany and in France, uh, which is the government of which seems to make quite different decisions in terms of how many resources to allocate for research. They are in better shape in terms of uh, their economies, but is there also a cultural shift to be made that, after all, uh, culture and uh, research counts for the growth of a country? Yeah, but uh, I don't want to, to appear controversial, but the culture also has to change in terms of what uh, academic expects from research funds. So we've been used for 20 years that you get a job and automatically you get two, three, ten thousand euros of richer with these research funds to go to a to a conference, to a seminar, and nobody checks what you do. Uh, so that maybe that's not the best way to use the money. Now there is the European Research Council. The European Research Council is a uh, is a new uh, way for the uh, Europe, for the European Union to finance research. The funding of the research camp is big, is as, as big as the National Science Foundation in the US. It's very competitive. So if you want money just to go to your friend's uh, uh, conference in Naples, they're not going to give it to you. So I think the culture has to change. There is money, but it's very competitive money that, that goes to high level research. And the cheap money, I don't think, should be there. Did it convince me? No, it doesn't seem that the national But for example, the thing that works is, and I think the, the ministry has done it, is to, you take, uh, you apply to the European Research Council, and it's very competitive, and you are, you are the first out of the list. No, it happened, you're very good, but there was not enough money. And then they finance you, but they take the, finance, the first guys who are just excluded from, the, that's the way to do it. Not the guy who had uh, his friend that committed to allocate the research. So that you can allocate the money. I, I think they're doing this a bit, I think it's a good way to do it. Yeah. Okay, so that's a good way to do it. Okay, any other questions? I'm Julia, I'm studying foreign languages too. I've never studied economics, so it may be that I lost myself a, self a bit but sometimes. After today, we start tomorrow. No, okay, yeah, of course. As my question is linked to everything we have said, as long as I've understood it. Um, if I'm not wrong, we, you mentioned the fact that we have money, but they go somewhere else. I have also heard this expression. And we also talk about, I don't know, infrastructures and so on. Just to make an example, which I find near to me because I'm living in Venice now. We recently heard something about the Mose, which was a very big project, which in the end seemed not so clear as it was at the beginning. Some money which were involved there had a destination which was quite different from the one which was planned at the beginning. So I agree with, with you that Maybe research which could not be, which could not impact in a very important way. For example, I recently heard a research which was about why do headphones in our um, in our bags get the strange shapes they get at the end when we walk. I may agree that it's not so important to know, and this is a fact. But on the other side, as we are talking about billions which went in places where they shouldn't be because it's not right that they are where they are. I don't know, I think that everything... Where, uh, I agree with you that high-level research should be granted. I think we should maybe also pay attention to these facts. 
I think it's better to research upon why headphones got the shape they got when they're in our boxes than knowing that money which comes also from taxes that my father or mother have given to Italy for a while where money of someone shouldn't be there who was not making something which was important for me but just for himself. So I agree with you that we, maybe investors and so on should trust a bit more countries and so on, but talking for me, I do not trust someone who's not operating for me and for my future. Because this is something I find normal. Why should I trust someone who's not making something good for me? And not for me, Julia, but for me, for students, for, for my country, for my grandfathers. When we talk about crisis, what does crisis mean? Where does a crisis end when there's someone who have a, a, a pension, I think it's the word, with which it's very difficult to get the end of the month? If we don't consider again the, the idea of what is equal, we shouldn't talk about, these things are nice, and I admit I understand them all the, all, only a part of them. But I don't know, they sound a bit strange to me when I also hear about these things, which are anyway part, of, if I'm right, of what you've said. So, okay, there's no a true question, it may sound, but I think I've uh, explained what I wanted to, to tell you. There are at least three important questions. Uh, so, um, one is, uh, you look around, you see that there are people who uh, have very low incomes or very low pensions. Um, you have to remember one thing, that uh, poverty increases when economies don't grow. So in economies that grow fast, many bad things can happen. Now, for example, the environment is not happy when uh, you grow too fast. But if you look at poverty in China, the number of poor people who cannot uh, eat enough during the day in the last 20 years in China has reduced by a factor of 10. Now, other terrible things have happened in China, but if you, want, if you are concerned about the poor, like Rawls' idea of the minimax, you have to grow. So in Italy, we don't grow now for about 10 years, so that's why you see the poor. Uh, yes. so on, on research, I'm a bit worried about what you said. Because I think a research should be very open. So I don't know, the guy who studied the shape of the iPhone in your bag, I don't know, maybe something's going to come out of this. So the idea that you want to, to target research, uh, usually it's a disaster, because you target things that uh, have no future. You should allow ideas to, if you look at what mathematicians do, they do things, say, why do I spend money paying for this guy? This uh, incomprehensible stuff. And maybe some of these ideas that will develop. So, so uh, pick, uh, selecting project is not, uh, you have to select people who have shown they are good at doing something, but let them let them do. Um, on the last thing, I promised that I, I didn't agree with her, I didn't uh, coordinate the question, but I just wrote a book on Venice and on the Mosque. If you go to the Castro Scarina here, you can buy it. And, and 10 euro is not, is not expensive. So let me give you two numbers which are interesting. So the, uh, your father, the taxpayer in Italy, uh, from 1984 to today, so in the past 30 years, has given Venice 18.4 billion euro. 18.4 says close to 20. 20 is as much as you would need to reduce the labor cost, half of the difference between the labor cost for all companies in Italy from the German level, from where it is today, it's the German level. It's a huge macroeconomy, 18.4 billion. You go around, I don't see evidence of 18.4 billion in improvement of the city. How much was uh, excessive expenditure, not stolen, was legally paid, but because it was done through a monopoly as opposed to competition, was uh, excessive. The excessive is something, I estimate something like two and a half billion. Two and a half billion is huge, right? Is, uh, how much is the Fondo FFO? How much is the?
with like 10% of what the state in every year every year gives to all the time university. And this was not so, was uh, the fact of having decided to do this project. Uh, and uh, and it had not finished yet. So did we spend 20 billion for, do we throw it away? We'll see. Of course, Professor Giavazzi has uh, an email that uh, if you want to question him more, you can write to him. And uh, now we should all buy the book <laughs> about all, uh, where our money went <laughs> uh, during these 20, past 20 years. Uh, this is called Le Mani, so let's, uh, what's the title of the book? Francesco? It's called Corruzione a Norma di Legge. Corruzione a Norma di Legge. But there was another book. Legal <laughs> there was c'era un altro libro che era Le mani sulla città, non ricordo male. Allora, un, arti un, un articolo, un articolo. Okay, thank you very much. It was a great. <laughs>